please do uh, have Matthew open in front of you. We'll be flipping back to, uh, to Samuel as well. Um, but uh, it would be helpful, I think, to, to have Matthew open in front of us uh, as we look at these uh, precious words from Matthew's Gospel. Um, some uh, conversations are memorable, aren't they, for their uh, significance and their consequences. Uh, will you do the honour of being my wife? No. Or, or yes. Uh, conversations that are memorable because uh, things once said are never the same again. They're significant. They have consequences. Well, this morning we're going to eavesdrop onto a conversation, not a proposal, but actually something that was far more significant, both in the lives of the people who were there, but also I want to persuade you this morning, significant in the history of the world, perhaps the most significant conversation in the history of the world. Now, I realise that's quite a claim, um, but I want to try and persuade, convince you that it, it's not an overblown one. Up to now, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus' ministry has been confined to Galilee. He's had a few sources outside of Israel, but he's been basically in the Galilean backwater. From here on in, he sets his face towards Jerusalem. Up till now, uh, the disciples really haven't got a clue what's been going on. They've heard what he's said, they've witnessed what he's done, but they don't really understand it. All that is about to change, and that will change everything. Uh, perhaps you should have seen it coming. I mean, Jesus has fed Israel in the wilderness, uh, and he's gathered the nations to him and fed them, given them a banquet too. So perhaps uh, we should have seen it coming. But we pick up on the conversation in chapter 16, in verse 11. Uh, we'll look at it with you, with me, will you? In these few verses, we have a question uh, from Jesus, uh, an answer uh, from the disciples, and then a promise from Jesus. And I want to look at those three things in turn with you this morning. So firstly, the question. And it's an absolutely critical question. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They've withdrawn up to the north uh, near the mountains of Caesarea Philippi. And here, far from the conflict uh, that they've just uh, moved away from, Jesus asks his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, the disciples by now are used to this rather enigmatic way that Jesus refers to himself. So it's clear that the question that they're asking him is, who do people say I am? Even if to date uh, they haven't really had a clue, uh, now thing is about to change. This is a crucial question. But it's important to understand exactly how the question is framed. It's more than just a question as to Jesus' identity. It is that. But it's more nuanced than that. And, and I think we can see that if we contrast the answers he gets from the disciples from the sort of answers you'd get if you were asked that people, a question to people today. I mean, imagine for a moment you're, you're having a drink with friends or sitting around sharing a meal uh, and, the question, and the question arises, or you manoeuvre the conversation so the question arises, who do people think Jesus is? What sort of answers do you think you'd get? Well, I, I, get, I guess you'd get any manner of question, answers uh, as Jesus does here. I mean, some people would say that he, no doubt, was a successful or unsuccessful, depending on the metric used, uh, religious leader. Some might see him as a, a moral teacher. Some might even say that they didn't even believe he ever existed. You get a whole lot of different views, but I think it's unlikely that you'd get the answers that Jesus gets here. You wouldn't get the answer that, well, I think he was John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Well, it's likely that the people we're speaking to have never heard of any of them. Which means, I think, to understand the question as it was posed, we need to understand the context in which it was posed, namely first century Jewish expectation. There was an expectation 
in first century Palestine, shaped by God's promises in the Old Testament, uh, that uh, God would come and visit his people and put things right. And this expectation has reached a fever pitch, partly because of the things Jesus has been saying and doing, as we've seen over the last few weeks. So within that context, the question becomes, well, more pointed, really, and it becomes not so much a question of identity, but of, well, of role, of purpose. Who do people say I am becomes, where do people say that I fit in, in the grand scheme of things? What role do people think I have in the plans and purposes of God? And that is why their answers are so different from the answers that we might get today, because they had a sense of history shaped by the purposes and promises of God. So the question is heard as, where do people say I fit in? And you can see from the answers that people had a whole different a set of answers to ours. They replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. They're the options. That's what people are saying about Jesus. Imagine a questionnaire evangelism. I don't know if anyone's ever done that, but uh, uh, sometimes people do it. They go out on the streets or door to door with questionnaires, uh, encouraging people to discuss and think about the Christian claim. And one of the questions is almost, who always, who do you think Jesus is? And it's often multiple choice with boxes to tick. If we were to do that today, and the multiple choice options were to be, who do you think Jesus is? John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Well, people would think we'd lost the plot, wouldn't they? But the significance of all these answers, what they have in common, is that they were all forerunners. Remember John the Baptist's message? It was to prepare the way for the Lord. And a few chapters ago, Herod had mused to himself whether Jesus was John the Baptist brought back from the dead. Elijah was an Old Testament prophet who was caught up with that expectation of God visiting his people. Some of the very last words of the Old Testament from Malachi are these, where God says to Israel through Malachi the prophet, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way for me. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Uh, it's not clear why Jeremiah gets a name check here, but it seems there's an expectation that there'll be a whole series of prophets leading up to the main event. Forerunners. Before God would come and fulfil his promises. And that's where Jesus, people were putting Jesus. He was one of these forerunners. So that's why he gets the answer he does to that question in verse 14. But as you'll see uh, from the conversation, he's not prepared to leave it there. He's not prepared that such an important conversation should end on such a note. And so he pursues it further and asks them directly, verse 15, but what about you? plural. Who do you say I am? Peter, he's often a spokesman for the disciples, isn't he? And he answers here, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you've got it. You've got it, Simon Peter. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but, but, but by my Father in heaven. Now just look at verse 17 again, will you, with me. Does anything strike you as a little bit odd or strange about that verse? Blessed are you, Simon Peter, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. I wonder how Peter and the disciples thought of their experience that day. I expect they'd have put things rather differently. I, I expect they'd have said something rather like, well, do you know what? It just finally dawned on me. Or do you know what, Jesus, I've been thinking about what you've been saying and doing over these, these last few months. And I've been thinking about it, I say, for months now. And at last, the pen is dropped. I've worked it out. And he had worked it out. 
as a miracle occurred, you see. Now, he didn't see a vision or hear a voice. There was no angel there, but nevertheless, a miracle had occurred. You see here, in this quiet backwater of a place, up in the northern hills of Galilee, God intervened in a mighty miracle. A much greater miracle than any leg lengthening or back healing that we might uh, muse about. As the disciples, previously blind, dull, come to a realisation, an understanding, not because they've worked it out, but because God has intervened and revealed to them by divine revelation what they now came to understand. For as the a New Testament writer will later say, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. It's only as God works by his Spirit that anyone can come to know the truth about Jesus. They've heard what he's heard, said, they've seen what he's done, they've reflected on it all, and as they've done that, God has revealed the truth to them. And so Jesus says in verse 17, how privileged, how fortunate you are, that's what blessed means, how fortunate you are. He doesn't say how clever you are. He says how blessed you are, how fortunate, how privileged that God has revealed that to you. But what is it that God has revealed to them? Well, we get two expressions here, don't we? You are the Messiah, the Christ, not a forerunner, the real deal. You're the one who's going to come and put things right. You're the son of the living God. Once again, we risk, I think, missing the force of these declarations, lacking the Old Testament background, as we so often do, and the expectations of a first century Jew. We miss its force. I mean, too easily we can see Christ as Jesus' surname. You know, um, Joseph Christ, Mary Christ, and Jesus Christ. But that's not the case, is it? The expectations in the first century was what the Christ would do. That's what the cause of the excitement is all about. Why expectations are so high. Now, these expectations stretch back for hundreds of years. And they're expressed perhaps most clearly in the passage that uh, Will read to us a moment ago from 2 Samuel 7. So if you just keep a finger or, or, or a, a bookmark in uh, Matthew 16 and just turn back with, you, with me very briefly to 2 Samuel 7. It's a promise that God made through the prophet Nathan to David about a descendant of David's. And listen to these words from 2 Samuel 7, written hundreds or a thousand years before the conversation we're listening to this morning. He says to David, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up for you offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now, if you know the story back then, uh, David died, uh, and you may remember he was followed by his son, Solomon, who ruled on the throne and built the temple. But in time, Solomon died, and the temple was destroyed. And then kings followed in after him in that line who did wrong and were punished, and their rules did not last. What Peter has come to understand, what has been revealed to the disciples, is that Jesus is the son of David of whom 2 Samuel speaks. And that he would be the one who would establish a kingdom forever. A king whose rule would last forever. The son 
of the living God. Did he understand, you think, the significance of his words? Well, I'm not sure, son of the living God, it's quite a claim, isn't it? But remember the words from 2 Samuel 7? I will be his father, and he will be my son. And his son will establish a kingdom forever. Rescue his people from their enemies. Build a house, a temple for God's name. Rule God's people forever. You see, Peter has come to understand that Jesus is not preparing the way. He's not the forerunner of the Messiah. He is the event itself. He's the real deal, the Messiah, the Christ, David's son, the son of the living God. Well, back to Matthew uh, chapter 16, we've had the question. Verse 15, we've had the answer. And now thirdly, the promise. Uh, possibly, arguably, I don't know what you think, that the most controversial of all promises uh, in the New Testament or the Bible, as history has taken its course, it's a verse, verses with not without uh, the contra its controversies. Perhaps the most helpful thing to understand it, as always, is to see it in context. Uh, this promise is first and foremost an affirmation, a confirmation of the declaration that Peter has just made. The promise that Jesus will indeed do what the Messiah, the Son of God, was to do. He will build a house for God's name. As we've already heard, uh, Solomon did just that. He built a temple. But now Jesus has become identified with the Christ, the Son of the living God. He says, verse 18, I will build... Not a temple this time, but my church. Indeed, he says a bit more than that, doesn't he? Let's have a look at it. And uh, Verse 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound on heaven, in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay, <clears throat> this is a, probably the point uh, in this morning's talk where the feedback I'll get will, will be, you should have stopped there, Martin. But I want to say just a few brief things about this verse because I think it, it's just helpful to get our head around it. So deep breath, fasten your seatbelts, six things about these verses that will help us see what's going on here. First question I want to ask of them, do these verses give Peter a special place in the work of Christ? Or to put it bluntly, is Jesus appointing the first Pope? Jesus said, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Well, the first thing to note is the play on words here. It's a bit lost in the English, but the Greek for Peter is Petros. It means rock not uh, Wayne the Rock or whatever his name was, but Peter the Rock. However, the word translated rock in verse 18, the one with the little r, is a different word in the Greek. It's the word Petra. Two words, Petros and Petra. Two words, similar sound, similar meaning. You are Petros, and on this Petra, I will build my church. Does this verse give Peter a preeminence in the life of the church? Well, as we reflect on that question, um, a controversial question in some ways, it's worth remembering what the new, rest of the New Testament says about Peter. And he certainly has a prominence amongst uh, the disciples at certain stages, doesn't he, in the New Testament? But he's hardly a pope, if you think about it. I mean, Acts 8, he was sent off uh, by the other disciple, apostles. He was held accountable for his actions by them in Acts 11. Yes, he was present at the Council of Jerusalem and he spoke in Acts 15, but he didn't in any, any sense preside over it or oversee it. And most striking of all, of course, in Galatians, I think, he is rebuked by Paul for uh, not being straightforward with the gospel. All of which is a long way from being a pope, I think. So what did Jesus mean when he said, you are Petrus, and on this Petra I will build my church? 
Question, is the rock, that Petra, that is being built on, what is it? Three options are given, usually. The first is that Petra is Petros, Peter himself. So did Jesus give, Peter the, give the name Peter because in some sense he was the, to be the rock on which Christ built his church? I don't think so, not least because if that's what he meant, he could have said it, couldn't he? He could have said, you are Petros and on you I shall build my church. Or he could have said, you are Petros and on this Petros I will build my church. But he didn't do either of that. He said, you are Petros and on this Petra I will build my church. He changed the word. Second option, is the, this rock Petra the faith that Peter has just expressed in Christ? So the sense becomes on this truth, on this rock of reality, on this realisation that you have just affirmed that I am the Christ upon such faith in God, on that foundation, I will build my church. Well, possibly, and I, I used to think that that was the case, um, but I realised this week there's actually a third option. Do you see it? One that I'd missed before, that seems more likely to fit the context here better. And that is that the rock upon which Jesus will build his church is not Peter himself, nor Peter's faith, but the one about whom this whole conversation has been about. So if that's right, the conversation goes something like this. Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, right, you're absolutely right. And on this rock, I will build my church. Simon is Petros, the rock or stone. Jesus is the rock, the Petra, the solid foundation of God's building program. Jesus is the foundation. The building is built on him. How he builds on that foundation, how he builds that foundation, well, we'll see that more next week. Thirdly, what is Jesus building on this foundation? Well, it's not a temple, is it? We might expect from 2 Samuel 7 uh, that it is, but he's not going to build a temple. He's going to build a church. And perhaps it needs uh, to be said that he's not talking about a building here, or he's not even a denomination, the Church of England, the Church of the Catholic Church, or whether the word is ecclesia, it's a gathering, it's an assembly, it's a people. The church is a people. The house, so to speak, the temple, so to speak, that he's building, will be a gathering of his people, those he gathers to himself. How would he build this church? Well, we're not really told here, to be honest, are we? We're just told that he'll do it. He will build his church. So we, we can be confident that he will. How will he do that? Well, that becomes clearer as the gospel goes on. And if you remember, by the time we reach the end of the gospel, it's clear that the church is built through the proclamation of the news about Jesus, that he is the Christ, the Son of God. It's by that message he gathers people to himself. And in doing so, the church is built. It can be built no other way. Two very quick things before we close. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, two really quick things. The, if the church that he's building is his people, note, it cannot be overcome. The church will not be destroyed like the temple was. No power can overcome his church. Yes, individual congregations may come and go, denominations will rise and fall, but the church of God will stand. No one can wreck his building project. It will never be in decline. It will stand forever. Not even death will defeat it. And finally, verse 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, he says. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What's going on there? Very briefly, Peter and the other apostles here will become workers in God's building project. That is, they'll become preachers, they'll become heralds of the gospel. 
And as they teach about Jesus, as they preach the gospel, the church of Jesus Christ is built. And as some come to hear the message of Christ and turn in, to repentance, in repentance and faith, they are let into the kingdom of heaven. They gather to Jesus. But also, alongside that, at the same time indeed, as people are told about Jesus, as the gospel is preached and heard, people say, no thanks, and they turn their back on him and are locked out of the kingdom of heaven. The keys that Peter is given to the kingdom of heaven is the gospel message that Peter has just had revealed to him. And as Peter proclaims that gospel, just as when I or you proclaim that gospel, heaven is opened to those who receive it and locked to those who will not. Well, I must uh, draw things to a close. We've uh, uh, overheard a remarkable conversation this morning. Uh, we've witnessed in those northern hills uh, the most significant conversation in the history of the world. And if we come back to our own time and reflect for a moment, how should we respond to such a privilege? Well, two things to start you off. No doubt you can think of more over the coming week. First, we should be very, very, very thankful, shouldn't we? That we've come to understand the truth about the Lord Jesus. That he is the Christ, the son of the living God. That God, in his mercy, has revealed it to us. For no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. We didn't work it out for ourselves. God, in his mercy, revealed it to us. And secondly, if you're someone who's not yet come to see that truth about Jesus, well, keep reading, keep listening to his words, keep looking at what he's done. And ask God in his mercy to reveal it to you. So you come to understand and know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your great grace and mercy towards us in revealing to us the truth about the Lord Jesus. Thank you that he is the Christ. Thank you that he is your Son. Thank you that he is building your church. And thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can hear the message uh, proclaimed that he is the Christ. Uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, that that message would open the kingdom for all of us and for many more others. And we pray that for Christ's sake. Amen.